Good evening. Lovely to be with you this evening. Welcome to St. Peter's Church here in Mendota for our panel discussion, Religious Freedom, A Path to Peace, Catholics and Muslims in Dialogue. I'm Jason Adkins, Executive Director of the Minnesota Catholic Conference, the public policy voice of the Catholic Church in Minnesota. We represent all six dioceses in Minnesota at the legislature and on policy matters in the public arena. Part of our work at the Catholic Conference entails working with partners across the ideological spectrum to build common ground for the common good. Good legislation can move forward when there is consensus among diverse groups about shared values. So not only do we work with ecumenical and interfaith partners legislatively, we also collaborate on educational events in which we have, can have conversations about important issues of shared interest and listen to one another's perspective to deepen our understanding and discern how to walk together to advance the common good. In addition to matters pertaining to uh, things as diverse as marriage, immigration, the environment, religious freedom has been a key issue in which we as a church have worked to build bridges of dialogue so that the shared American value of religious freedom may continue to be protected in law and valued in the culture. Tonight's event is one of those conversations and is part of the Catholic Church's observance of Religious Liberty Week nationwide, in which we gather together to pray and educate ourselves about the importance of religious liberty as integral to the protection of human dignity, but also look at threats to the rights of faith communities and conscience, both in the United States and abroad. In this evening's conversation, we bring together Catholic and Muslim perspectives in a timely and important manner for us here in Minnesota. We have a large Catholic community comprising around 20% of the population and one of the largest Muslim communities in the United States. Tensions regarding the increased Muslim presence in many communities and a general ignorance about what Muslims in the United States do and do not believe underscore the importance of this event. Many of the same arguments made for why Catholics could not be good citizens are being leveled at Muslims today. Similarly, the beliefs of Catholics are once again being pilloried as a threat to American freedom. Both communities are trying to navigate an increasingly secular environment and live their faith publicly. This evening is meant to explore together how we can live that faith in an uncompromising manner while still upholding the rights of others to religious freedom, recognizing that threats to other faiths will have an impact on our own. Pope Francis and Grand Imam Ahmed El Tayeb of the Al Azhar Mosque in Cairo in their joint document on, document on human fraternity have provided us with both a model and an inspiration for tonight's conversation. It is on their work to build paths to peace and bridges of dialogue and solidarity with one another do we work here in our local context. And indeed, Pope Francis and the Grand Imam have asked us to study that document and reflect on it further. And we have many copies of that in the back that you can take with you um, this evening on your way out the door. Before I introduce our first panelists and say more about logistics, let me invite Father Eric Rutten to the podium. Father Rutten is chair of the Archdiocesan Commission for Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs, and he will offer a few words of greeting on behalf of Archbishop Hebden, who could not be here this week, this evening. Welcome, Father Rutten. Good evening, all. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm grateful for you to be here as well in this important conversation. And uh, there's a distinction that is sometimes made between uh, praying together and together praying. And I hope that we can be together praying here this evening, each of us, for uh, greater understanding and freedom in our hearts and in our world. I bring you greetings from Archbishop Hebda, and uh, salam alaikum, peace be with you and be upon you this evening. If you'll allow me, I'd like to take just a moment in silence so all of us can offer a prayer from our own heart and in our own way. But then following that, I'd just have a short prayer just that's from my own heart, if I can. So let's just take a moment in silence and ask um, uh, the Almighty to be with us. We ask your presence, your presence and your blessings upon this assembly this evening. Help us to know your will in our lives and in our nation and in our world. Help us to be strong and effective advocates for religious freedom for one another and for all. Help us to protect and preserve that space we all need 
to seek and to find you. Bless our presenters and speakers. Open our minds and hearts to hear you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Father Rutten. I wanted to acknowledge uh, the presence also of our friends from the Jewish community as well. Um, we have representatives of the Jewish Community Relations Council here this evening, and uh, they blessed us with their presence. So thank you uh, to Sally and others who came and welcome. The logistics for the evening are as follows. I just wanted to say a little bit about our panel and the format for our discussion. We have four panelists this evening, two Catholics and two Muslims, each representing a diverse uh, perspective within their own community. So we have uh, uh, Latin Rite Catholic, Bill Stevenson, and a Maronite Catholic, Ali Kamsadeen. And then we have uh, uh, two Muslims. We originally had uh, someone named Oda Muharwish, uh, who couldn't be with us this evening because of a family emergency. So Dr. Tamara Gray, Sheikha Tamara Gray is with us, so welcome. So they, uh, Sheikh Tamara Gray and um, Kassar Hussain, the president of the Islamic Center, all represent two different schools of Islamic jurisprudence, both Sunni Muslims, but representing two different schools. So we have different perspectives even within uh, our respective communities, both Catholic and Muslim. So uh, we hope for a robust conversation this evening. We'll alternate Catholic and Muslim perspectives. Each will speak for about 10 minutes. Um, following the panel presentations, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers, and we'll have a really good discussion this evening. On your tables, you will see note cards and pens. During the course of the evening, as you have questions, feel free to write those down. Raise your hand, and someone from our team will come around and pick them up. And we know there's gonna be a lot of questions. We wanna sort through them. There might be duplicative ones. So during the course of the panel discussion, I will moderate those and then choose from among the uh, questions, uh, some questions, some good questions for our panelists this evening. Uh, following our presentation, there'll be time for fellowship and conversation. We've got um, uh, baklava and cookies and other desserts that will be served outside. And everything is halal friendly. Um, as well. So that'll be a nice time for fellowship and further discussion, both with our panelists and with each other, uh, after the conclusion of the discussion this evening. Um, bathrooms are right outside, and feel free to get out during the course of the evening if you need to use the restroom as well. Our first panelist of the evening is Ali Kamsadeen, who graduated summa cum laude with his license in sacred theology from the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome, the Angelicum. He specializes in ecumenical and interreligious studies. His thesis was titled, Shia Eschatology in the Light of Its History and Theology, Setting the Way for a Theological Dialogue. Ali has received a number of scholarships and fellowships from organizations from around the world to continue the work of ecumenical and interreligious dialogue. He's currently working on his doctorate in sacred theology. His involvement in ecumenism and interreligious dialogue is a natural result of being raised in Lebanon and having a religiously diverse family. Ali finds that his background affords him the opportunity to connect with and build bridges of understanding between diverse communities. Let's welcome Ali Kamsadeen. Ali. Thank you, Jason. Uh, and thank you for being here. So I hope I'll stick to 10 minutes. I'll not go further than that. And I hope that you'll be patient with me too. Is everyone hearing me well? Great. So the document on human fraternity for world peace and living together signed by Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar is a result of more than 50 years of implanting the culture of dialogue by the Catholic Church. The seed was planted in 1965 when the document Nossa Aetate uh, came to the light from the Catholic Church. And by this document, the Catholic Church adopted the concept of dialogue with other religions. Now, I will state uh, from Nostra Aetate, the Catholic Church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these religions. She has a high regard for the manner of life and conduct the precepts and doctrines which, although differing in many ways from her own teaching, nevertheless often reflect a ray of that truth which enlightens all men. Now, the document of human fraternity that was signed this year in February in Dubai is a milestone 
and the dialogue between the broader religions. And broader religions, this is a term that Paul, uh, Pope John Paul II used to use it to refer for the relation between Islam and Christianity. And it is just the beginning. This document is just the beginning. And we still have a lot of work to do. Now, the Catholic Church became more and more aware in the past 54 years that dialogue is part of her identity. And it does not contradict her universal message, neither her call for evangeliz evangelization. Therefore, the Catholic Church urged the faithful to walk the path of religious freedom, use the culture of interreligious dialogue in their milieu and society as a tool for all by which peace and harmony can be achieved. Now, two fundamental questions arise. What do we mean by dialogue? And what do we mean by culture of dialogue? And in order to be able to answer, answer those questions, we should take the time to see what the Catholic Church is intending by dialogue and why it is important that we should be involved in the culture of dialogue. Now, people sometimes think of dialogue as a situation in which religious leaders and scholars sit down together, make pleasant, optimistic statements, chew their words carefully, try to put a positive twist on controversial questions and avoid any topic that might cause friction or hard feelings. In short, they are thinking of something akin to an interreligious tea party. <laughs> if this is the idea we have, it is no wonder that many Christians and followers of other religious are suspicious of the value of such encounter. They'll, they will see it that it is a waste of time. And if this is what dialogue is really about, it would be hard to understand why the Catholic Church insists on it. Now, Pope John Paul II took a major initiative to promote world peace and understanding among believers by twice convoking a day of prayer for peace in Assisi. And it is not coincidence that Pope John Paul II chose Assisi a place to make such a day happen, and they still do it till our, our day. Why Assisi? Does any one of you know St. Francis? St. Francis is a very famous sa saint in Italy and in the Christian, in the Catholic Church. And in 1219, uh, he, during the Fifth Crusade, he went to Egypt in order to meet the Sultan and try to get into a discussion with him. And during their meeting, they discussed interface conflict, they discussed war, and the search for peace. So that's why the Pope John Paul II chose this place. And also, another thing regarding the, it's related to the document, it is not a coincidence that it was signed in February. If you ask me why, because it will mark the 800 years memory of the visit of Pope Francis to al-Sultan in Egypt. So it is an important place. Now back to Pope John Paul II. And during the conclusion of the day of, uh, the day of prayer for peace in 1986, Pope John Paul II said, the very fact that we have come to Assisi from various quarters of the world is in itself a sign of this common path, which humanity is called to tread. Either we learn to walk together in peace and harmony, or we drift apart and ruin ourselves and others. We hope that the pilgrimage to Assisi has taught us a new to be aware of the common origin and common destiny of humankind. Let us see in it an anticipation of what God would like to would like the developing history of humanity to be, a fraternal journey in which we accompany one another toward the transcendent goal which he sets for us. And by th this statement, we can say that interreligious dialogue in itself is walking together. 
as walking side by side. There is no part that is advancing on the other or leading the other. And also it is a pilgrimage. And the pilgrimage has a starting point and ending point. Now back to the question, what is dialogue? The Catholic Church affirmed that in our time, dialogue can be understood in many ways. And one of them is Tea Party, which is not the true way of dialogue or concept of dialogue. At the purely human level, it is a reciprocal communication leading to a common goal, or at a deeper level, level to interpersonal communion. In the context of religious plurality, it means not only discussion, but also constructive relations with individual and communities of other religions, which in obedience to truth and respect for freedom are directed at mutual understanding. It includes witness and exploration of re respective religious conviction with reference to the initiative of the Catholic Church to reach out to people of other religions. Dialogue is also understood as an attitude of respect and friendship. Now, the Catholic Church warned us that interreligious dialogue in itself does not aim to conversion. The purpose is not to convert the other. Nevertheless, it does not exclude that it might be an occasion of conversion. Now, Pope Francis, since his election as Pope, has never ceased calling all the faithful to go out to the peripheries, to the mar margins. And one, we might ask ourselves what that has to do with a joint document signed by Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar. Now, dialogue requires that I, as a person, I should real realize that me, I, as a human being, I cannot exist without the other. We are social beings by nature. And as a person who exists, I need to be with others. And that fact implies that I have the responsibility to be engaged and that I'm not alone in the world. Therefore, as a human being, we are in constant dialogue. First, we are in dialogue with ourselves. Second, we are in dialogue with the other. And thirdly, we are in dialogue with God. And God in himself, as a Christian, I'm talking now from my Christian perspective, we believe God is Trinity. He is dialogue. The Trinity is dialogue. Even salvation was brought to humanity by an encounter between divine and human. Now, in my personal opinion, Pope Francis, when he invites us to go out to the peripheries on different occasions, he is first calling the church to, to stand outside of herself. And that's exactly what St. Francis did 800 years ago. He stood outside of himself. He stood outside of the church. He, want, he went to the peripheries. He went to meet the Sultan in Egypt. So the church is calling us also to stand, Pope well, Francis is calling us to stand outside of ourselves. He is inviting each one to exit from his center, from his ego or his I, and to be in relationship with the world. And it is a call to realize the fullness of our humanity. And by going outside of myself, the I, encounter the other who is different than me. And by this encounter, I can realize that the other who is different than me is not a threat for me. Therefore, I will not seek to change him. Instead, I will realize that this person who says diversity is the missing piece that fulfill me. And by doing so, I will develop and grow in my Catholic identity. I will discover my true Catholic identity when I meet the other. And we should, they stood, uh, sorry. 
And that is what the Catholic Church and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar did in this joint document. They stood outside of themselves. They went to the periphery. And it is not a coincidence that they chose Dubai. Do you have any idea why they chose Dubai? Dubai is close to Yemen. And Yemen is a land of war now. There is famines, there is war. So they're standing outside of themselves to reach the other. And when you take the document to read it, you will find that they, they cite at the beginning of the document the poor, the orphans, the people who have lost their security. Another way they are, they are meeting the human fraternity. And by coming together, an opportunity is created. I'm almost done. <laughs> now, the Catholic Church see dialogue as a tool where people from different religious tradition meet, the, meet to listen to each other. Dialogue start with listening. And to come to know and respect one another and thus to work together in society on project of common concern. And by coming together, an opportunity is created for the global, uh, globalization of one's localized problems. Problems such as misunderstandings and intolerance in society, which are often expressed in violent conflicts and are at times inflamed by the manipulation of religious affiliation and sensitivities. Finally, interreligious dialogue is the way to face the growing challenges and move toward peaceful coexistence among believers of different religions. We should keep in mind that interreligious dialogue is not exclusive for religious leader or scholar, but also includes civil authorities, individual, and groups from different walks of life. Thank you. Thank you, Aliyah. That is a great way to start our evening with a discussion about dialogue in a robust sense. And despite the fact that we have cookies and treats and baklava and lemonade afterwards, we don't want to be just a tea party here. We want to have a good, robust discussion. So that was great. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kassar Hussein. She's a personal friend uh, through our work together with the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition. She is a businesswoman dedicated to serving the community through her professional and volunteer work. For 17 years, Kassar has worked at a Fortune 500 company in commercial underwriting. She has volunteered as the director of the Islamic Education Program at the Shakopee Prison. She has served as the board chairwoman of Minnesota's only Muslim civil rights and legal advocacy organization, the Council on American Islamic Relations, Minnesota. Kassar currently sits as the first female president of the Islamic Center of Minnesota and is also a recipient of the Outstanding Leadership Award from the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesota and was named one of the 50 over 50 from Pollen and AARP in the category of nonprofit contributions. She's been also featured in the She Rose series of the Reviving Islamic, Hood, Islamic Sisterhood Empowerment. Please welcome Kasara Singh. Thank you, Jason. Bring it closer too so I can hear you more closer. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. It means greetings of peace. I'm honored to be here um, on this panel today. Thank you, Jason, for putting this great event together. It is much needed, and um, this is a great work. Thank you. Um, Tonight, I'll reflect on um, religious freedom and what it means to me in light of spiritual, economic, and social aspects of... Um, uh, so religious freedom, it is a fundamental right and it is about human dignity. Um, one of the misconceptions of, um, of Islam is that when people see a woman like me wearing a headscarf, um, this is called hijab, uh, they conclude that I'm oppressed, or the men in my family um, are making me do this. A woman in Islam has full rights. I have the right to practice my religion, 
the right to education, and I have the right to financial freedom, and the right to marry the person of my choice. And I manage uh, work and family like any other woman, and I do community work with the support of my family. There is no oppression in our tradition. Islam is a 1,400-year-old religion, and within Islam, we have, uh, we have the birth of the hospitals, medicine, and first university in the world was founded by a woman. Um, like Jason said, I um, currently am leading um, Islamic Center of Minnesota. Um, Islamic Center is in Fridley. It is a mosque and it's a community center. And it was established 49 years ago um, by the Muslim students who were attending um, school at the University of Minnesota. Among many other services, we host um, a free clinic, a food shelf, and the longest running interfaith dialogue in the Twin Cities. So for the past 25 years, we had the interfaith dialogue. Uh, it still continues um, every once a month we meet and we have a great discussion. Um, the need today for us um, as, as one, one Minnesota community is to work with each other to bring awareness of the issues. Times have changed in our country. The political landscape is different than what it was before. There is the fear of this other, Islamophobia, racism, and bigotry are on the rise. It is unbelievable what we see out there. And there is this threat to our communities. We all need to stand together in these difficult times and work on solutions. So it is important that we work for social justice. Jason and I serve on, on the board of JRLC, Joint Religious uh, Legislative Coalition. So JRLC is an interfaith public interest group, um, and through its work, we have influenced Minnesota legislation in many areas, like housing, healthcare, et cetera. So we need to go beyond our faith. Today, you'll hear a lot about um, uh, interfaith dialogue and things like that. So we need to go beyond our faith to spread the values of goodness and peace. In these challenging times, every one of us must make the important choice to engage in respectful dialogue. We need to attend each other's events, so we meet people of different backgrounds. Often good conversations uh, for understanding are going to happen around the dinner table and then social gatherings. Let us find ways to come together where we can engage in conversations. Interfaith dialogue is necessary and getting to know each other is important. I have always believed in interfaith actions more than in dialogue. We can sit and discuss religion to find that there are more commonalities than differences. Um, to me, actions speak louder than words. So we need to engage in ourselves with community projects. So we work together to know each other well, uh, that kind of a thing. I'll end with this. At the end of Ramadan, uh, our holy month of fasting, um, on the last day we celebrate, um, we, we, we celebrate. So there is a breakfast that Islamic Center hosts. And this year, we were going to cancel that breakfast because we did not have enough volunteers. So one of our friends uh, from NCJW, uh, National Council of Jewish Women, found out. And they um, said they are going to bring in 40 volunteers to serve breakfast for us on the day of, the, um, of our celebration. So, so this is the kind of work we need to get in, be involved in. This is the kind of things that we need to be uh, working together in to get to know each other. And um, that, that's the only way to know each other. Uh, otherwise, there is that fear of other. And uh, that's all I have. And I'll be more than happy to answer questions after.
thank you, Kassar, for reminding us of the importance of not just discussions, but engagement and encounter. We talk in the Christian community of the ecumenism of the trenches, but I think that can be broadened to uh, interreligious work together in the trenches. Our next speaker is, speaker is Dr. Bill Stevenson. He's an associate professor of dogmatic theology at the St. Paul Seminary. He received his PhD in theology and political philosophy from Boston College, where he was a Lyndon Harry Bradley Foundation Fellow for the study of religion and public life. In addition to his work at the seminary, Dr. Stevenson teaches in a variety of programs, including the master's program in Catholic studies at the University of St. Thomas, the Archbishop Harry J. Flynn Catechetical Institute, and the Institute for the Diaconate and Diaconate Formation for the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis. He serves on the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops National Evangelical Catholic Dialogue, as well as in the Archdiocesan Commission for Ecumenical and Religious Affairs. Please welcome Dr. Bill Stevenson. Thank you, Jason. Can you all hear me? If, no, okay. I don't want to eat the mic either, so. Would it be better if I, no, I'll just say here. Uh, so I, I, I feel like um, uh, I should mention, but you so beautifully um, uh, 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 talked about friendship and, um, and actually getting involved in the lives of others and not just sort of having formal uh, dialogues and so forth. And I feel like I ought to mention uh, something that you'll probably otherwise never hear about. Um, last year, uh, there was a, a, a Shia center uh, Muslim Center um, uh, in the northwestern suburbs that uh, asked me if I would ask Archbishop Hebda if he would come for an iftar um, one evening to break the fast um, during Ramadan. And um, after some, uh, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of gatekeepers at the chancery, you know, between uh, somebody like me and the archbishop. And after just a little bit of back and forth, I found out that uh, I heard got word that Archbishop Hebda said he would love to. And it actually was on Memorial Day of last year, and he'd had a busy weekend and so forth, and he came all by himself. No photographers, nobody to cover this for the Catholic, nobody would have known about it. And he spent a good three hours uh, um, just enjoying fellowship and uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful evening um, for all. Uh, and in fact, the president of the center had said to him in front of the whole congregation, he said, I've just one thing that we would like to ask of you, Archbishop. And I thought, uh-oh, this could get uncomfortable. <laughs> one thing that we, re we ask of you and uh, Archbishop, I said, sure, and he said, uh, most of us have never been in the cathedral. Do you think you could give us a tour sometime? <laughs> uh, and of course, he, he agreed. I don't know whether that's happened yet, but I just thought that was a lovely instance of our own archbishop doing something that was not a photo op and so forth, and it was just a gesture of friendship, and uh, it was a really lovely time. But he didn't come to share anecdotes. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit, very briefly this evening, because I want to give plenty of time for conversation. Um, about sort of the, the, the ground of, sort of the foundation for um, uh, making common cause amongst the religions uh, for religious freedom. Um, and and, to, and to, to, to begin by saying that somehow when we do um, interreligious inter uh, dialogue or make common cause in political matters, uh, the foundation for that kind of work has to go deeper than just mere sort of expediency um, or sort of the mutually beneficial. Um, and that ultimately, between Catholics and Muslims in particular, um, and, and, or, and you can extend all three of the, the so-called Abrahamic religions, um, that there is a common view um, of the human person, common understanding of the human per person, um, and uh, the conditions for human flourishing. Now, not alike in every single respect, but it's astonishing when one does a little study just how many points of, of, of not just similarity, but vast areas of, of, of commonality. And, uh, and, it's, and, and it's as striking how many similarities there are uh, as there are differences between the two uh, uh, sort of theological anthropologies and the predominant sort of understanding of the human person in our culture uh, today. Um, put briefly, uh, we understand that the human person um, is made by God 
uh, it's, the soul is immediately created uh, by God uh, and, and therefore has a determinate nature. That is to say, in fact, there's a wonderful um, uh, term, and it's, it's only a fool would actually start to talk uh, as though he were intelligent about um, Islamic theology, but so here I go. Um, <laughs> Uh, this idea of fitra, like a, uh, an inherent nature that everybody is born with, right? Um, uh, that, there's, that there's actually a human nature, uh, a soul that, is, that has certain rights and responsibilities, um, that is, if you will, called to a certain kind of human excellence, um, uh, and, and that there are conditions for attaining that kind of perfection. Uh, and this is something that's found in sort of classical Islamic philosophy as well as, of course, in jurisprudence and in, um, uh, and in revelation. Um, but it's, a, it's also part of the, the common philosophical tradition that Islam classically has shared um, with the Christian tradition. I was sort of struck. I, I didn't know that much. I, beginning in the sort of the late 1980s when I was in graduate school, I had begun a study of sort of classical um, Islamic philosophers, um, but didn't really know that much about sort of contemporary Islam or sort of the jurisprudential side of things. Um, and I was really struck when I did just a sort of amateur study of, uh, of Sharia and its, and its aims and purposes, that one of the goods that is, is protected and nurtured by Sharia law is the good of the intellect, aqal, right? This, the, the, that, that the human person, um, that sort of the, the uh, the human soul um, is distinguished from the beasts because it has intellect. It can, it can come, to, it can ask questions and come to a knowledge of the truth of things and even then to a knowledge of the truth about um, what and who uh, God is. Um, but the condition for human flourishing in both Islam and Christianity um, is liberty, is freedom. Uh, there's no compulsion in religion, there can't be compulsion in religion, but if that's true, there can be no compulsion um, in, the, uh, in, in growth in human excellence and virtue, right? That has to be, in order for there to be genuine human flourishing, there has to be um, genuine liberty, right? And so therefore, the understanding of the political order in both Catholicism um, and in Islam, so far as I understand it, is that the political is always sort of delimited and circumscribed by something that is prior to it and above it, right? That, that, that um, the political can't have an absolute, the government can't have an absolute claim uh, on citizens. And in fact, the good of, of government, the, a healthy political order, depends upon um, uh, an awareness of its own limitations, right? Um, and so uh, um, there is this way in which we recognize both the need for a, a good political order, for, for uh, just laws um, that guide and also um, steer um, our waywardness, um, uh, but also the limitations uh, on that um, uh, as well. Um, it's interesting, I, sometimes we think, even sometimes Catholics will talk about uh, the value of religious liberty as being something of a Johnny-come-lately of, of Catholic values. It wasn't always the case, right? And, um, and, and even those uh, uh, Catholics might even go further and say, that's never been a value uh, in Islam, right? This is just simple um, uh, rank ignorance. Um, and one of the things that's sort of surprising um, when you do a little study about places where uh, Christians and, and Muslims have lived historically together um, is that in many cases, um, Muslims have helped, uh, Muslim governments have actually helped Christians to live together in peace. Um, I don't know, do I have a few, just a couple of minutes left? Um, and so, let me give you just an example uh, of this. That um, prior to, uh, prior to the, the Muslim conquest of Byzantium, um, the, the monks of Mount Athos, the great sort of spiritual center of Greece, were always um, at each other's throats, and they were, and the abbots of the monasteries of Mount Athos uh, were uh, were ever complaining that they had to choose sides and, and rival claimants to the to the throne, the emperor's throne of, of, of Byzantium. Uh, and in fact, uh, when this reached a fever pitch right before the conquest, 
um, uh, one rival claimant to the throne um, actually hired mercenaries, Catalan mercenaries uh, from Spain, and they destroyed a great number of the monasteries on Mount Athos. Um, when the conquest came, uh, there was actually a restoration of, um, of, of the peace, and actually the, um, uh, uh, it's Selim the First, uh, uh, funded the rebuilding of the monasteries, and there was actually a revival of monastic life. And in 1912, when all of this sort of comes to an end, when the Greek armies are on the march and, and that ends, um, the governor of Mount Athos, who was not an enviable position to be, to, that's a, that was sort of the least desirable government position uh, at that time because um, he wasn't a monk and no women are allowed on Mount Athos, so it's sort of a lonely job. But uh, when the Greek army was on the march and he was waiting to, for them to arrive and to be arrested, uh, he, um, he, he says to a French reporter who was there, um, look, you've had nothing but peace and toleration and tolerance for these last 500 years. When we go, there will be a vacuum and the Christians will be at each other's throats. Um, and in fact, this actually was the case. Uh, and so a sort of balanced view of, uh, of religious liberty in both Islamic and Christian traditions um, requires that we look uh, at those sort of long forgotten, little discussed uh, facts, um, some of which actually last for, in this, in this, in this case in particular, uh, it's a 500 year uh, old major fact of, of world history that has to be, I think, especially in our own sort of political sort of poisonous political um, uh, uh, atmosphere. These kinds of things, these are the sorts of stories that need to be told um, and uh, it, uh, in order to sort of uh, build both trust uh, and, and goodwill. I think I'll leave it uh, Thank you, Dr. Stevenson, for helping us identify some of those commonalities that provide uh, uh, our understanding of religious freedom and human dignity as pre-political. Before I introduce our final panelist, I know that people are out there writing. I see you writing your questions down. If you've got questions, again, please raise your hand and roll those up, and we'll have someone from our team come around. I see one right down here. Um, I feel like an auction. There's one here, there's one here. Um, Raise your hand even if someone's speaking, someone will come around and collect those. We want to start reviewing those and going through them uh, and make sure as many questions are, can be answered as possible. Our final panelist for the evening is Shika Dr. Tamara Gray. She is the founder of Robata, an organization dedicated to promoting positive cultural change through creative educational experiences. She is an Islamic scholar and holds multiple ijazas in Islamic sacred texts and subject matters. Maybe you can tell us what an ijaza is, too. Sheikha Dr. Tamara completed her doctorate in the Leadership Policy and Administration Program at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. Sheikha Dr. Tamara speaks frequently about issues of gender, leadership, Islam, and spirituality, locally, nationally, and globally. Her book, Joy Jots, Exercises for a Happy Heart, is in its third print. Sheikha Dr. Tamara is part of the Islamic Society of North America Task Force for More Inclusive and Welcoming Mosques and on the advisory board of the Muslim Women's Association of Chicago and the Muslim Anti-Racism Committee. Please welcome Sheikha Dr. Tamara Gray. Good afternoon. I'm so happy to be here. It's a beautiful day. And I, last night I was with my sister, her name is Allie Gray. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Same thing, but it's my sister. Anyway, her name is Allie Gray, and she's a singer, and she was recording a music video. I was there too because I'm in it. And the reason I'm in it is because it's an anti-Islamophobia song. And she's taken a lot of bravery on her part to turn this into a music video because as a country, singer, her audience might not be too friendly uh, when they find out who her sister is. But it's a whole song about you are talking about my sister, and it's a reflection on what's been happening in the United States over the past couple of years, and um, she wants to 
share that I, like her, am kind of normal. I like things like coffee and grape nuts and stuff like that. And so part of, I think, what we have to think about as Catholic and Muslim people as we come together in these very difficult times is what does it mean to come together and what does it mean to think about one another as normal people and what does it mean to stand up for one another in bravery. My husband's last name is Aymadi and about a thousand years ago or so, his family in Damascus, Syria, were the, their family home was the home for Christians who were being persecuted at the time. I think if we look historically at the way we've acted with one another on a human basis, we're going to find a lot of beautiful stories like that. But when we look at ourselves, when we begin to act as a gang, we begin to look at the other as a scary group of people, and we agree with one another to be against one another. And I would like to point out something for us to think about here as far as what we need to be looking out for as communities. We live in a time where on one hand we talk about diversity, on one hand in the schools we talk about the importance of representation and speaking one's own voice and listening to the voices of those who come from different communities and different ways of life. On the other hand, we have a, another sort of uh, xenophobic, if you will, uh, voice. But lost to both of these, both sides of this rhetoric and this dialogue is the person of faith. It isn't cool to be a person of faith no matter what your faith is. It isn't okay to say, hi, I believe in God. And if, you're, if there is any persecuted or bullied group of people, it is, uh, it is those who have made that decision to be not just a quiet person of faith quietly in my house and nobody really knows and don't worry, I'm gonna live like you do anyway and we're just the same and I don't have any real principles. But to say not only do I have principles, but those principles are based on my belief in God is not cool. And it's become more and more difficult for any group of religious people to do that. That's highly represented in the lack of youth in all of our uh, events, if we can look around the room today. Our youth don't have space to be people of faith. We haven't given them bravery. We haven't given them that example that says it's okay to stand up and be a person of faith no matter where we are. And I started with the example of my sister because she talked to me a lot about how it took a lot of bravery from her to be able to put this song on a music video. Our responsibility as people of faith, I think, in this world of diversity is to begin to create space where people can be people of faith amongst those who are not people of faith. That secularism as a movement or as a way of life doesn't have to be the only way of life. We need to expose our students, our children, our youth to the possibility of a lifestyle with God. And if we can't do that, we really run the risk of a time coming when these dialogues are only about the history of religion and not about the way religion can be lived in people's lives and spaces of faith in modern times. For Muslims, we have a language thing going on here, which I sometimes think in our communication with non-Muslims or people of other faiths, where it's hard to understand us. So I'm going to give you a little language lesson here uh, today. Uh, for Muslims, we go around all the time saying this phrase, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And this is our statement of faith, and it's very important. We say it all the time in every prayer. We say it a couple of times. And it's translated into English, and you'll read in the books and the dictionaries and encyclopedias, and you'll see on YouTube videos and wherever you get your information from, that's translated as there is no God but God. It's a really important problem in this translation because the Arabic phrase begins with the word no. It doesn't begin with the word English word there is not. And this is a very subtle difference, but I want to share it with you because I want you to understand the 
framework that many Muslim communities come from. It's like the poetry of Emily Dickinson, when she says, not is there of hope. Do you know that poem? It continues, I don't want to impress right now. I'll come to me in a minute and help. But the point being that not is there of hope immediately to set up for you that there is something really desperate here. It is a removal of all that possibly could be so that we can understand what that next sentence is. And that is how this Arabic phrase is manifested in the life of a Muslim. Not is there of divinity, but God. So I know Muslims have a reputation for radicalism, and I probably shouldn't even use the word radical here, but I'm going to use it anyway because I'm going to be brave. I think if Muslims are radical in anything, we are radical monotheists. Where monotheism is really important to us. We get a little bit worried about things that might be like shaky around that. We get uncomfortable. And of course, on our side, we need to learn how to be open minded about how other people express monotheism. But I wanted to share with you that piece. And the second piece of that is Muhammad al Rasulullah, or Muhammad is a prophet of God, and a messenger or a prophet, depending on the words you want. And I know that we've had lots of confusing things in the world around Muslim experience of prophethood with the cartoons in Denmark a number of years back and whatever else we've had. There's, there's been a lot of confusion. What's wrong with those Muslims, man? They're so weird. Just sit down and be quiet. And what does it bother you? What does, it, what does this bother you that people are making cartoons? And while I certainly don't agree with violence or the violent uh, threats or any of that stuff, I think that's sort of a, uh, it's a social problem and a political problem. It is true that Muslims are really attached to and love very much and really respect prophets. We have this idea of hierarchy of faith. And we would include in that anyone who was of the prophets of God, those we would say those that we know and those who we don't know, admitting that there are probably many prophets that we've never heard of. And perhaps someone of another faith might tell us something. We might say, huh, I wonder if that was an ancient prophet that was sent with that beautiful message that sounds so lovely and so full of goodness and virtue and the other good things that we're all supposed to be standing together with. And another phrase is, I'm going to call it a phrase. How am I doing? On time. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to just do this one because I'm going to circle around to what I was saying earlier. I'm going to talk about this hijab. So Kosar talks about the hijab, that this thing we wear on our head is called a hijab. And this is, I think, one of, one of the reasons it's quite difficult for secular society to accept is because we become this really obnoxious billboard. Everywhere we go, we're like, I believe in God. I believe in God. I believe in God. I believe in God. Just wearing this scarf is the uncomfortable conversation that we are people who believe in God and enough to dress weird when nobody else is dressing that way. And that piece of that, I want you to know, is something that many Muslim women struggle with. They struggle with, do I want to be the standard for all Muslims, where every time I go outside, if I'm having a bad day, and you sell me coffee that has cream in it, and I ordered black coffee, if I tell you now that I'm really upset about that, does that mean you're going to think that all Muslims get mad about coffee? They might. But I don't really want to be the one who carries that responsibility. And so it's a question that we ask ourselves, and we think about this in our own interactions with people of other faiths. That when I come to you, if I order a sandwich, I've this happened to me before. Actually, I was in a restaurant recently. If I order food and you put bacon on my eggs, and then you say, oh, I'll just take them off. And I say, no, I want you to go back and make a new plate. Now I think, oh, man. They're going to think Muslims are so difficult. And we are a little bit difficult about pork, I'll admit that. But I mean, the, this whole thing about me carrying one billion people on my shoulders is really hard. And so how we can help one another is really to recognize that each individual expression of faith 
is not necessarily, is, is two things. One, it's not necessarily the expression of every single Muslim's mood for that day. But at the same time, it's a valuable expression of who I am as a person. And every day I step out in hijab or, or uh, whatever you want to call it, a scarf, I am spending my entire day claiming, not hiding, but claiming and saying and hoping that I will be better as this woman of faith that has chosen every single day to wear that, not just on my sleeve, if you will, but on my head. So thank you. Great, again, if you have questions, please raise your hand and Sarah will come around and collect those and we'll try to make as many, uh, get through as many as possible. Uh, obviously with a, non, a largely non-Muslim audience, we have a lot of questions that want to know more about Islam. So I hope uh, Sheikha, Tamara, and uh, Kassar will be um, amenable to that, to be put on the spot a little bit. One uh, that I'd, a question that we received that I'd like to get um, the perspectives of all the panelists, first of all, is um, a question about the, uh, at least in the Catholic tradition, the Virgin Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus, obviously a prominent figure in Christian Catholicism, but also a prominent character in the Quran as well. How might um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, be a point of union and uh, guide our walk together uh, between Catholics and Muslims? Maybe just each say just a little bit about that. I think that'd be really fasting and telling we often hear about Jesus and Islam and the difference. Again, monotheism, there's no God but Allah, and uh, Muhammad is his prophet, but Jesus, the role of Jesus is talked about a lot. But what about Mary, the mother of Jesus? Ali? Yeah. Okay, that's a great question. I can go for a long time on that. Uh, go for a short time on that. I will. I will <laughs> we need to make a distinction. And keep in mind, when we say similar, it doesn't mean identical. Yes, we, we have a similar God, but it's not identical. For Christian, it's Trinitarian God. For Muslim, it's Unitarian God, one God. So we should keep that in mind. Now, regarding Mary in the Quran and in the Christian tradition, First of all, starting with the name Mary, Mother of Jesus. And now I'm talking from a scholar perspective. I teach. I studied Islam. I teach Islam. I'm, start, I'm talking from the objective uh, perspective. Mary, Mother of Jesus. Uh, Mary in the Quran, uh, the Holy Quran, and in the Christian tradition, technically it's the similar figure. Now, there is few differences uh, between Mary found in Islam and Christianity. Uh, one of them, for example, the account of birth of uh, Jesus. Uh, it's different. The, what we find in the uh, Holy Quran is different than what we find in the Christian tradition, uh, for example. Uh, also, the use of Mary, mother of Jesus, is to emphasize that Jesus is a human from the Muslim perspective. He is the son of a human being who is Mary. Also, the second part of this question, yes, in my personal belief and my personal experience, Mary can be a center point, a point of uh, encounter between two religions. For example, in my home country, Lebanon, uh, we, as Muslim and Christian, we celebrate the Annunciation. Because if you compare the Annunciation in the Holy Quran and in the Bible, you will see that there is a lot of similarity. So yes, Mary could be a point of uh, encounter between two religions. Thank you. The story of Maryam in the Quran is, I mean, yeah, there's some differences and some similarities. I think, I think it's cool that we share the story. But I thought that was kind of neat, that idea. So. Well, I don't have much to, to add to uh, what, what Ali uh, said, uh, that there, there is some way in which, of course, this is a point of commonality. And there's a genuine, it's more than just a sort of, 
you know, scriptural similarity or overlap mm -hmm. or something. There's a genuine sort of love. Um, <laughs> pious love, affection for Mary, uh, precisely in her motherhood. Um, it's, uh, it, this, is, this is remarkable um, in itself. Now, obviously for Christians, um, we venerate Mary, we honor Mary um, uh, because she's regarded uh, for us as, as, as Theotokos, right, the God-bearer. Um, r rather than just Mary, um, the, the mother of, of this, this prophet. I shouldn't say just Mary, but, but, but it's precisely because of Jesus's, um, as Christians hold, um, Jesus's divine personhood that she's honored. But at the same time, both in the Quran and in sacred scripture, she receives within herself the word of God. I mean, this is an amazing, there's a connection there between yeah. um, the surah uh, uh, that's devoted to Mary um, and the beginning of, of John's gospel. Um, and this is, this is, in my experience actually, this has been a point of very fruitful um, and great fun conversation um, with, uh, with Muslim friends uh, and, uh, and uh, scholars, so. Just, I would like to add one more thing. Uh, we mentioned, uh, Dr. Will, you mentioned about the encounter that happened earlier between Muslim and Christian. And I just remembered, in Syria, there is a convent called Saidneya. Saidneya, it means the convent mm -hmm. of, uh, I don't know how to translate it, but it is a convent of Mary. And according to uh, one of the historians from uh, Netherlands in the medieval period, he wrote that this shrine, Christian shrine, has been uh, people from all over the region, Muslim and Christian, go there in order to venerate Mary, Muslim and Christian. And also I need, I, I want to emphasize also as a Christian, we don't worship Mary, we venerate Mary. So we need to be careful too. Thank you. I really think this next question is a compelling one. It asks, can Christians and Muslims really come to live together in true harmony and peace, or are our differences too much to overcome, and thus working for common causes together becomes difficult? And this person provides a good example, I think. Can two American soldiers, one a Muslim and the other a Christian, who come to find themselves together in a foxhole, there's no atheist in foxholes, but there might be a Muslim and a Christian. Um, can they come together to actually trust each other, to actually fight together for a common American goal or victory while working together? And one might say, is there something in the what Chesterton called the American creed? Um, we hold these truths. Can, can the principles and American values perhaps be a bridge um, that overcomes religious differences. We talk about religious freedom not being a Catholic value or Christian value or a religious value, but an American value, right? So maybe I'd invite Bill to take a stab at that and then one of, my, one of our Muslim panelists as well. Can the American creed uh, be a way to bridge or religious differences and build common ground between the two communities? Yes, <laughs> I think so. Um, it, it, th there's an assumption here. I mean, it's amazing sort of that that there's a way that you, you had mentioned earlier, sort of the, that that Muslims nowadays are regarded popularly uh, um, in the way that Catholics were regarded by sort of the, the waspish um, American culture, you know, a uh, hundred, well, more than a hundred um, years ago. You know, c the Catholic Church was the poor immigrant church, um, an image that they, it continued to fight. Um, frankly, long after it didn't need to fight that um, anymore. Uh, but there's this idea that there's somehow this this kind of phantom political loyalty that Muslims have uh, to something um, that's not American and that they don't value uh, liberty, they don't value the kinds of things that every American values. Um, and this just simply, I think, is is demonstrably false, right? This is demonstrably false. Uh, and, and, and insofar, and, and I feel like I've, I, I, I'm confident that I've done a wide enough, maybe not deep enough, but wide enough reading in, in um, contemporary Muslim thinkers to say, to see that like, there aren't, in any sort of respectable Muslim s uh, scholarship, there, there isn't a group of people sort of waiting in the wings to reestablish a caliphate in 
you know, Fridley. Uh, right, this is, this is a complete um, uh, boogeyman. So I, I think this is, it's clear, and, and that, that of course we, that, that there's, um, that there are truths that are held to be self-evident, um, and those truths were held to be self-evident actually before there was an American Constitution or a Declaration of Independence by both Muslims um, and Catholics. And I just add to that that there have been many Muslims and Christians in foxholes over the past 10, 15 years, and I know some of them. And to imagine that there are not Muslims serving in the United States Army, Marines, Air Force, Navy, is to really misunderstand who is defending our country within and without. Um, yeah, I'll say that. Okay. I, I, this is double dipping. Can double I just dip. say one more thing? Um, actually, Muslims and, and, and Catholics live together um, and continue in certain communities, although they're shrinking and getting fewer and farther between, um, uh, that live together uh, naturally uh, for centuries, and they didn't need sort of official dialogues to do that. Mm. Um, it, it came sort of naturally and organically, and so I think that uh, there's a sort of historical track record here as well. I think some Americans and, and Catholics in particular, we hear about it all the time. They, we talk about these issues and we hear perspectives from Islam and we hear from American Muslims, but they look around the world and they, and they see Islamic extremism, right? It's a fact. Um, the bombings, the, the Boko Harams, the Al Qaeda's, the ISIS, the Sri Lankan bombings that we experience. And of course, um, Christians are killing each other in Ukraine too, for example. So it's not that anyone's innocent here. But I think for a lot of Catholics and a lot of Americans and a lot of our questions have similar themes, is that they see the violence, they hear about the violence, it's a reality. And then why, were, why should Americans believe that uh, Muslims will be different here or are different here? Maybe you could say something about, just like there are, uh, well, there, in Catholics we have one, uh, party line, so to speak, right? We have one spokesperson for the faith, the church is the church, but there are many different Christians and many different perspectives, and one can draw an analogy with Islam, there are different perspectives in uh, Islam as well, and you can't write off one Islam, or one Muslim as, as you know, being the bad apple that represents all of Islam, and the same can be said for Christians as well. So maybe you could speak a little bit, it's kind of the elephant in the room, right? The, the, the violence that we see, why is it different here? How do you explain that, or how do you talk to people about those questions? And maybe both of our panel, Muslim panels can take a stab at that. I lived in Damascus for 20 years, and I left and came back to Minnesota in 2012 because of the war. The war that we saw on the news here that were called Muslim extremists killed more Muslims than you could ever imagine. My husband's aunt, when she was 22 years old, fell in love with a guy who was unrecruited love. They didn't get married, she was always sad. Instead, he became the art curator for a town there called Palmyra, which had historical um, monuments and uh, artifacts going back thousands and thousands of years. When ISIS entered Palmyra, he and his 75-year-old self stood at the door where they had, he first he hid them away, and he refused to give them the um, information about where he had stored these artifacts. And so they killed him. And this is, this man was a Muslim man who was killed, a practicing Muslim man who felt it was his religious duty to protect the historical artifacts of his country. ISIS is a scourge upon the earth, is a result of colonialism and post-colonial dictatorships and foreign influence in countries that have gone there to, if you will, rape the earth, take from take and not give back. There are serious and real reasons for violence but they are not any religion any more than the, those who are killing people in abortion clinics or those who are shooting up the schools in America. For whatever reason they may claim, there's something else going on there. There isn't a religious um, foundation for these actions. And Boko Haram in, in uh, Africa as well. All of these people that we hear about on the news, 
the first people who are suffering are the practicing Muslims around the world who are suffering in ways I can't even, I mean, I can't even tell you the way that Syria has suffered and my friends and families have suffered and how they certainly don't want to see the success of anything even smelling like the work that ISIS has or the, the war and the scourge that ISIS has been in that country. That's what I'm saying. Um, all I would say is um, if you take the population of um, the entire world of Muslims and see who's doing all of these things, it's like 0.0001% of the Muslims are doing these, uh, these kind of things. Again, it comes down to uh, you know, it's just a few handful of people doing these kind of things and the entire religion is being blamed for. Um, so it is, the blame goes to media as well um, because it's not being portray portrayed right and um, they don't call, um, call out when, um, uh, you know, when, when there is something happening, they would immediately call out a terrorist attack on something and a Muslim terrorist and in other cases, they don't. So it is just the media who's doing the hype. And if you take out the numbers out of billions of people in the world, and uh, it's 0.0000.1% of the people who are doing these kind of things. Yeah. I would like to share with you something. My, this semester, I asked my students, what are your sources? For the news, how do you? What is your sources for information about what's happening in the world? And the only answer I got was social media. So first, we need to get to know from where we're getting our sources for the news. Secondly, as I spoken earlier, we need to get out of ourselves to meet the other. And most of the time, the misunderstanding and why we consider all, for example, you meet someone who consider all Muslim are terrorists, or the opposite. Because of ignorance, we have to educate ourselves about the other, get to know why he do that. For example, we mentioned, we mentioned earlier the hijab, Sheikh Tamara mentioned the hijab. For the hijab in the early of Islam, it was a way of distinguish Muslim women from other women who are not, who doesn't have faith. So there is a reason behind that. It's a way of testimony, of personal faith. It's a personal decision. So it is very important to educate ourselves about the other. And then once we start to know what, who is the other, we don't see him anymore as a threat. We're going outside of ourselves to meet the other. That's all. One question I ask, and anyone can take a stab at this. How do you square uh, the responsibility and call to listen and dialogue at the same time with the intention of conversion? I mean, we as Christians, and then presumably as Muslims as well, are called to evangelize, and that was the Christian term, evangelize, um, and bring people to our faith. We're, we're Christians, and we have our own identities, respectively, because we think it's true. <laughs> I'm not Muslim because I think Catholicism is true. And then, Jesus is the Son of God, right? So how do you as panelists reconcile the call to dialogue and, and interfaith work at the same time with the responsibility to bring people into your faith tradition as well? This question worked from both sides, Muslim and Christian, because in Islam there is a Dawa also, which is similar to this question from the Christian perspective. This perspective was till the Second Council, the Second Vatican Council, where the Church said that outside the Catholic Church there is no salvation. And then in the Second Vatican Council, there was a new revelation, if you want. There is no change in the teaching because there is a revelation. So the Fathers came to a concept where in Lumen Gentium, uh, paragraph 8, if I'm not mistaken, they say that the fullness of the truth and salvation is in the Catholic Church, 
but they don't deny that the other religion has part of the uh, truth. And later on with Nusayetate, after Nusayetate, a huge debate inside the Catholic Church was raised. Well, we are called to for evangelization, but also we are now called for dialogue, so what should we do? And for that reason, later on, a document came, came out from the Vatican, from the Pontifical Council, uh, Interreligious Council, and it's called Proclamation, uh, Dialogue and Proclamation. And they address this issue, so you can read it, it's a nice document. But the thing they say that we don't need to convert the other. If I live my face as it is, and the others see me living my face, he will start asking questions. He will start wondering, why are you doing that? And just by living my own face and keeping it for myself, and letting the other question, question me, it's a way of evangelization. And in order to do that, we need dialogue. So the aim is not to convert, to be a witness for your own faith, and at the same, they, at the same time, they don't contradict with each other. Thank you. Um, the dialogue is to get to know each other better. It is not to convert each other, um, to live peacefully with each other. That's what I believe in. And um, in Islam, it's, it says that um, we are to teach others or let others know what our religion says. It is not up to us to convert somebody. It comes from God. Um, all our, my job is just to let others know, um, and also with our actions. Um, to, to tell you a little story, we, at the Islamic Center, we just hired an individual, and she goes, I have decided to uh, take the Shahada to become a Muslim. And when we asked her, um, how did you decide that, she said, just the behavior of everybody here, the way she has been treated. The way everybody um, is everybody is behaving, and she loved the way everything was going. So that's why she decided to um, to convert. Uh, her daughter is also a Muslim who converted um, ten years ago, but she has never thought about becoming a Muslim until she started to work at Islamic Center. So we believe that it is by behavior you just. Um, not convert people, just you show you who you are um, as a person of faith. But I, I guess I substantially agree with everything that's been said so far, which makes for bad dialogue, I guess. But the best sort of dialogue really is where, um, uh, where each side um, uh, is, is confident that they, um, uh, that possess isn't exactly the word, um, but th 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 that they hold to a kind of comprehensive truth. That it's, it's the best sort of dialogue precisely because both sides believe that everything's at stake somehow, mm -hmm. right? This is really, really important. So it really, it, uh, ecumenical and, and interreligious di dialogue for the last, oh, maybe close to 50 years has, has deserved in a way, a kind of, in some ways, uh, a, a sort of bad reputation because it really was sort of, as Ali so um, memorably put it, a kind of tea party. <laughs> we just simply agree with one another and affirm and, and so forth. But what kind of, a, I mean, that would be a boring conversation at a party, at a dinner party. Right? The, the best kinds of conversation are where we can disagree in friendship over the things that matter most to us. Um, and also, it's a great opportunity to learn, to be challenged by that. I just keep thinking to myself how busy we are trying to take care of our youth, that we just don't have time to worry about conversions of each other. I want to find a church that's really good with their youth and go and learn. What are you doing? How are you doing that? So we can bring it back into our community because we're all, I think, across the board, we're all struggling to help our youth and help them just manage this crazy world as it is today. So that, that's what's on my mind. It doesn't really answer the question, maybe, but that's what I'm thinking about. <laughs> Shake it, Dr. Tamara. One quick question before we get to a, a more substantive one. Where can your sister's song be heard? 
people want to know. Oh, I love you so much. <laughs> and if you would like to donate to the um, creation of the music video, see me after the panel. Um, sh she's alliegray.com, and she does have her song there. It's also on iTunes. It's called You Are Talking About My Sister. She has a great, it's her whole album is called Love Letters, and she has one for my mother, one for my father. Um, it's a really great album, actually. But the one about me is You Are Talking About My Sister, and she's Allie, A-L-I, Gray, G-R-A-Y, dot com. I wanted to point out one really common theme that went through that, the responses to that last question. Dialogue as a form of evangelization in the Christian sense, but also uh, the common theme among all our panelists that uh, faith grows by attraction, as Pope Francis says, mm -hmm. right? Um, the distinction between evangelization and proselytization, that there's something in who we are and how we model ourselves that is attractive and can be evangelical, so to speak, in a Christian, using Christian terminology by its very nature. This is kind of a, a tough question, but I can tell you from a lot of experience engaging um, on questions that have a relation or intersection with Islam, one I get all the time, and someone, of course, asked it here. So worth addressing, I think, um, in a, for our audience. And this will be filmed, so hopefully benefit to others as well. And from our, a question directed to our Muslim panelists, I hear this word and this concept a lot. Help us unpack it. The question asks, relationships are built on trust, right? Friendship is built on trust. But there's a lot of um, concern about this concept in Islam called, I think I'm pronouncing it right, taqiyya. T-A-Q-I-Y-Y-A, -Y -Y this concept Shia. where um, you can supposedly deceive the unbeliever to advance the faith or protect yourself. Um, this is a very, I hear it all the time. It's, this is something that Muslims practice. We can't trust them, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if you can speak to that question a lot, but it's one we get on a regular basis and something we hear about very often. So first of all, it's not a common concept amongst Muslims. Kosa and I are looking at each other going, huh? What is he talking about? Um, I'm not sure. What is it in Arabic? It's a Shia. It's with a Qaf or with a Kaf? Taqiyya, Taqiyya, Taqwa. Taqiyya or Taqwa. Taqwa, you can hide from people. Taqwa, yani Taqwa. Taqwa, Taqwa Allah. Fear of God or? Fear. I don't, actually, my answer to, oh, there's an answer in the audience. Taqwa. No, I said that's different. Tuqiya. You are not faithful to what you do. Tuqiya and taqwa. It's Arabic. Tuqiya and taqwa. But tuqiya is not a theory. Taqwa, taqwa, theory, but tuqiya, no. Taqwa, and I really don't know how to answer this question except for what I will speak to the trust issue. I don't really know how to answer the question because I am a scholar of Islam. I studied for 20 years in Syria. I took classes. I memorized the Quran. I have ijazes, which is a, a license in Islamic uh, belief and all this stuff. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I think whoever asked this question, he meant dawah, because then that is used to defend and promote Islam. So dawah. Let's thank our panelists for their conversation this evening.